There's a lot you can learn from out of the past. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Out of the Past, brought to you by the Martin County Historical Society. I am Jim Marushin, curator, and with me, as always, is our executive director, Lenny Tweeden. Lenny, sounds like we have a great guest for our episode today. We do. It's Pat Gary. He's talking about his book that he just put out, The Power of Gratitude. Oh, sure. Uh, Pat is uh, currently a, a law professor at the University of South Dakota. Mm-hmm. His family has been very active in the community. Um, just so many different things that he has uh, put in the book that many people are going to remember. So, sure. a great interview. Uh, he did a great job, a lot of information. And we're going to have a, a book signing July 17th at 2 in the afternoon Ooh. and 7 in the evening. Pat's got a presentation and he'll have books, and there'll be a book signing as well. Oh, that'll be really interesting. Yes, for sure. Well, before we jump into that, you mind if I show the people a few things? Yeah, what'd you bring? Well, just gonna, in case you want to do a little uh, cooking, cooking today. Yeah, Lenny, do you remember Park Street Grocery? I do, yes. Yeah, these are uh, oven mitts from Park Street <clears throat> Grocery. Um, we have a lot of interesting advertising items. People would put their business name on just about anything they could give away to people. So this has their uh, phone number, and we never forget friends. Right. Yeah. Definitely. And then if you need some protection for your feet... I brought these with me. With all the rain we've had, it might not be a bad idea. <laughs> we might, yeah. These are hobnail boots, and they come from World War One. You can see they would go up quite far on a person's leg. Yeah. So when they were in the trenches, protecting themselves from a lot of water. So, <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, Eddie, should we hop into the interview? Well, why don't you show me that book? Sure. And just one more time, Pat Gary. The Power of Gratitude. The interview is great. The presentation will be July 17th at 2 in the afternoon and 7 in the evening. Book signing and presentation. Awesome. Sounds good. So let's watch it. Perfect. Welcome. Today I'm going to visit with Patrick Gary about his book, The Power of Gratitude. And I'll also be asking him some questions. But before I do that, I'd just like everyone to know that uh, Pat is going to have a book signing and a presentation on July 17th here at the Pioneer Museum. It will be at two in the afternoon and seven in the evening. So mark your calendars. Uh, It'll be very interesting and I'm sure you'll want to see it. Okay, Pat, uh, your parents, Michael and Elizabeth Gary, well known in the community and the area. What brought them to Martin County? So my father's uh, grandparents actually settled in Martin County. Uh, they homesteaded a farm east of Gukin and uh, both his grandparents then had emigrated from Ireland, they landed in Boston, made their way across uh, the country, um, uh, had to stop and work in lumber camps on the way, but uh, got here because there was an Irish settlement uh, in Gukin. they um, uh, homesteaded. So really my father's roots then are Mm -hmm. in Martin County. Uh, His father then uh, went into the grain elevator business and uh, owned a elevator in uh, western, southwestern Minnesota, but he came back to Fairmont when he was in the seventh grade. Mm. And uh, once he came back then, uh, he stayed here. He went, went on to college, but came back to, to Fairmont after college. My mother's story is a little bit um, more unpredictable. She got a job here when KSUM radio station opened. Um, they started the station in, um, now, I don't know, that something like the late 40s, yeah, early 50s. I think it was, yeah, 1940, I think Okay. Uh, New Year's and, Eve, I think, is when it started. And I think she worked in Spencer, Iowa, mm-hmm. at the radio station. She was hired on, and so she hosted the first uh, morning radio show. Oh, really? At KSUM. Wow. That's how my parents met. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, your family, as you grew up, you had more than one or two brothers and sisters? Eight. Um, together. So I had seven brothers seven and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Right. What was it like growing up in a big family? Yeah, now, mind you, we were a small <laughs> family for the Catholic families at the okay. time. <laughs> we always considered ourselves a, you know, like, why didn't we have a big family? Sure. Okay. Uh, but, it, well, we, uh, you know, we, uh, we uh, lived in a big house. Um, my father bought it. It was, uh, I never did truly know the story about that house because uh, I think it was in some kind of bank foreclosure. Oh. And um, 
My father's father told him he was crazy for buying it. Uh, it needed a lot of work, which is odd because it was at that time only about 35 years old. Hmm. And yet it, it was sort of seen as a, a rundown old home. Um, so, um, you know, it, it was big enough uh, for all of us. But, uh, I mean, you can imagine, you know, 10 people and, sure. and uh, 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 dogs and pets and everything running around <laughs> the place. And, and uh, But I guess we never really thought of ourselves as, as, a, as a big family. That was just sort of the, the way mm-hmm. it was. You know, from what I knew of Mike, he was always very positive. But I'm sure throughout the course of his lifetime, he must have faced some adversities. And what were some that you recall anyway, or that you're aware of that stick out in your mind? Yeah, um, I would say maybe his biggest adversity might have been when he was uh, when he was in college. He went away to college, uh, went to the University of Notre Dame, and uh, he got sick and uh, kept getting sicker and sicker, and went to the doctor up there, and they discovered that he had rheumatic fever. Hmm. which at the time was a very uh, serious disease. So they sent him home, and he was confined to his bed for six months. Um, That must have been a challenge. That was was difficult. Um, um, He'd have friends who come visit him, of course, and his poor mother was trying to enforce (laughs) the doctor's orders, which uh, went by the wayside. But but that would have a a permanent effect on him. He survived Mm -hmm. it, but it left him with... with, uh, with heart damage, um, and uh, I mean that was maybe one of the biggest. I oftentimes think of my mother, and I write about this in the book. About she put herself through college. She grew mm-hmm. up in Minneapolis, and she had to take. So she went to St. Catherine's College, which was across the river from Minneapolis. But she had to take four buses oh, to get yeah. there. And so I oftentimes think about that. She didn't oftentimes talk about it that much, but I, I think about what it must have been like to, you know, get up in the morning, go through five bus changes, um, and never really having the kind of life that, you know, that normal college students would have because uh, at, at five o'clock she'd have to start her trek home then. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then, of course, I think they had a, a lot of adversities during. Um, the 1960s and 70s. Sure. Uh, my dad owned a, a grain elevator, and even at that time, independently owned grain elevators were, um, you know, going out. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the grain business is very volatile, uh, so that that was a, a tough business. I don't think we ever really realized growing up uh, how much risks were involved and how much change were, was going on. It, it, it was. It was tough. I also write about it in the book when the big grain elevators came in. Uh, mm-hmm. Dreyfus built one in Gukin, and you know, by all accounts, that should have been spelled the end of our little elevator. But we survived, and Dreyfus didn't. And why is it? Do you think that you or your family survived, or that Mike survived? I think I read some things in the book about that, but how how would you characterize that? I think he one is he really knew. Grain. He knew how he knew the economics of it, so he knew how to protect himself mm-hmm. against all of the the volatility. Um, you you know you can't be right all the time, mm-hmm. and I think too many people try to be right all the time, and and uh, it, it doesn't matter how big you are, that's going to send you into a tailspin. But I think even more important, yeah, he he treated his customers um, in, in a special yeah. way, and they never left him. So. Uh, could they get higher prices when a when a hundred car train came into Dreyfus? Sure. They they could get higher prices, but they didn't leave him. And um, he had a way of connecting, and he tried his best to um, y- you know connect in ways. Uh, you know, when people came in, he treated everybody the same. It doesn't matter if you had a little pickup load of grain. You mm-hmm. know, you you were treated the same. You were treated like a valued customer. He had a pot machine at the office. And um, we always had it. It was a dime. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was just, I, I use that little story to show that he, he sort of, he believed in, in kind of reaching back and, and uh, connecting with people based upon tradition and family. And, and that's the way it used to be. And he was going to keep some semblance of, sure. of how things used to be amidst this time of big change. Faithful customers. 
Yeah, he did have, and he had great, and he always talked about them, and he yeah. loved his customers. And it's because of the way he treated them. Yeah, um, and they reciprocated, reciprocated for that reason. I think. <laughs> I remember going to the elevator with him in the morning, and he, of course he'd, you know, we'd be driving there, and uh, I'd, I'd be unfortunately, you know, the the, the teenager sitting in the car, <laughs> not real anxious to, about this this new day, and and when he would come over the hill, mm -hmm. and if he saw a truck in the driveway all of a sudden that accelerator went down to the floor <laughs> and boy it was i mean boom the day started you know that a customer was there and and it was time to uh, it was time to serve that customer sure interesting um i don't believe they ever went south for the winter did they they never did they they you know they took vacations um but they very deliberately never never had a second home never went south um, I mean, they loved it here. The, the winter to them uh, was, I, I don't know, inconsequential. I'd say they weren't mm -hmm. going to leave this. Um, they weren't going to leave this as their home, and, and, and I mean, they, they truly loved it. And I think, uh, you know, I think that's what, what um, oftentimes led to their their legacy and people's memories of it because they. They didn't stay here because they had to. They stay here because they loved it, but they loved it because they loved the people. Sure. And, um, you know, that was another thing when I was growing up and at the elevator. You know, he would start talking to a customer, and even though it was past closing time, <laughs> and if there's one thing I knew as a kid, it was closing time. Uh, but you, we never closed on time. We never did. If somebody needed something or if they sure. it, it, just talking to him, getting to know him. So I think it was that. That genuine love of people, that genuine interest of people, that in in a way you did, you can't replicate. You know, from what I know of Mike, when he was here at the museum, he had a real love for history. What what do you think prompted that, or why did he have such a love for history, and especially local history? Yeah, he did have a love for that. Uh, I mean, part of it, I think, he saw this. I mean, his this uh, this place as being a. a place that his family came to, a place that gave his family the life that it had, you know, and looking mm -hmm. back at generations and, and um, uh, I mean, we would often go to the cemetery, you know, and, and then kind of like tour all of these generations of, of people. Sure. And, and uh, so he, he knew the place and he valued it, but I think he saw it. He was, I think he was very grateful, uh, grateful, gratitude, a, a theme I talk a lot in the book, very grateful for this area for what it gave to his family you know it gave this family a home it gave his family a, a place to live and prosper and grow and and um he was always interested in history though oh he, he, every part of history mm -hmm. i mean every history documentary he could look at he sure. he watched um he, he just had a genuine love for history so on a personal level but then also on a, a level like that was, he was very interested in it, very curious. My, my, my father was curious almost beyond description. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that to, from a person, regretfully from a person who I think is all too often, <laughs> I'm not very curious, you know. But he always was, and history was one of his subjects yeah. he loved. And he knew a lot about local history, like Frank Wade and some of the people that were instrumental in starting this, this area, this city. So he had a lot of knowledge about, about people like that and about what happened years ago. He did. People came to him all the time. In fact, I think we have a photo of my father with you <laughs> when you did a program on Frank Wade. I think that was it. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, he, he, he did love it. He loved coming down here. And, and uh, you know, I'll say this, Lenny, he loved dealing with you and... and uh, well, a, I, I appreciated him too, and, and you know, would visit, and I learned a lot about local history and life from him. I really did, and I appreciate that. One of the things I was real happy about is that um, later in life, um, he had always urged me to do things, and I unfortunately brushed him off on things. But mm -hmm. I decided to write a family history, and um, uh, it, I did it when I was home for the summer. And so um, at night, like around dinner, we'd start and we'd just start talking. So I'd kind of, uh, I'd have the, you know, the format uh, sort of ready and we'd talk for several hours. Sure. And then during the day, I'd write it up 
you know, and, and, and put it together. And over the course of the summer, um, I put together that history. But I'm glad I did it because his memory mm -hmm. was really better than any kind of, and more comprehensive than any kind of, uh, oh, yeah. uh, you know, documentary evidence I had. Hmm, great. Uh, one of the things I remember about Mike is when I go to the KC Hall. He was always a greeter. Isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think was he always a greeter? I I never remember doing anything but he was always <laughs> they always put him on as a greeter. So he sat at the table as people would come in and and uh, I I really think in some ways he became the event itself he, because uh, I would work inside. Um, handing out you know pancakes or sausages <laughs> um, not one of the not one of the more esteemed jobs and uh, so i could hear what was going on out in the hallway and the people would come in and and my dad um who oftentimes worked with denny Pilesky at that yeah. mm -hmm. at that post and the shouts and everything and and you know i always used to joke about it because I always said, there, there ought to be an express line. If you want to get in fast, you go around, you pay an extra $5, you know. Uh, but I don't think anybody would have taken him no, up on that because I people would stand in line. They waited in line. Right. They wanted to be talked to, and he'd remember. And, and uh, it was just like that. He was very interested in people. He wanted yeah. to talk to them, and he'd remember things about their yeah. past. Yeah. Um, I think he, he used to say, too often times, people shy away from the past. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even from those sad times in the past. But a lot of times those sad times in the past, you, you want to remember something sure. of it, and he always did. That leads me into something else that I remember reading about in your book. It seems that you were at one point a guest lecturer somewhere at a college, and, and you t took your parents along, and you left to do something, and you came back and Tell us about that. That was, I thought it was very interesting. <laughs> well, and kind of goes along with this uh, KC Reader deal. Yeah, it's um, so um, whenever I had a some kind of like speaking engagement or event anywhere within driving distance, mm -hmm. I'd take my parents. And um, so we'd go there and, and uh, draw, you know, we'd stay overnight. And sometimes we had several places that we went to. And um, <clears throat> anyway, um, yeah, um, so. Uh, one time, I think the time that you're talking about, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I dropped him off um, and they, they had some kind of reception beforehand. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I always wanted to take a few minutes before getting up there to talk to kind of figure out, OK, am I set? What am I sure. going to say? So sure. I wanted I always want some a little bit of alone time, which was oftentimes <laughs> difficult with my father, uh, because that's the last thing he wanted. And um Anyway, so I sometimes I went to the restroom for those sure. you know five or so minutes, and and uh, uh, anyway, as I came back to kind of check on him and get ready to go in, you know, I, I couldn't I couldn't find him, uh, and and finally he was with a whole group of faculty members and students talking, and he had somehow integrated himself into this <laughs> whole group, and my mom was there, and he was there, and and um, you know th then uh, later on, of course, I was. Um, introduced as his son so in uh, in the course of 10 minutes uh -huh. he got to know people in a way that you know that that he really became the the, the kind of the anchor uh of that and uh another time i was doing something with him which i remember um is um we had a debate going on, and sometimes debates are not so friendly. Sometimes mm -hmm. debates are kind of adversarial, and I kind of figured that this one was going to probably be that way. Um, I met the uh, the other person up on the stage, and and um, then my dad brought up something to me. He was always borrowing something, usually a pen, because he he took notes. If he was here right now, he'd be taking notes. Taking notes. Yeah, he, he took he took notes at parties. He took notes at weddings. Anytime somebody gave a talk, he took a note. Really? Yeah. Um, anyway, um, uh, this guy saw my dad bring me the pen. <clears throat> Obviously, he had met my dad before. Mm -hmm. Asked me if I was his son. And by golly, after that, that was the sweetest debate I'd ever had before. <laughs> I mean, he was as kind and considered as could be. So thanks, yeah. Dad, for that. Yeah, well, he was influential that way. Yeah, he was. Well, you know, he was always, it seemed like, helping people, people he didn't know. Uh, it didn't matter. 
uh, if they were, what stage of life they were in. I re remember reading about one example, I think it was done by Ward Park, <laughs> where he saw a girl walking and he was kind of concerned about her. And I'm not sure you shared the same concern but <laughs> as you were telling me, but tell us about that incident. Yeah, that was uh, that was just like one of those kind of memorable kind of incidents that I thought um, not only um, revealed the nature of my father, but but also kind of contrasted me with my father. So we were going to lunch, and um, uh, you know, I, I, too often I think like maybe many kids, I don't know, uh, you, you get to be very functional. You know, there's a job to do, we're going to mm -hmm. do it, and and we always went out for lunch. Um, so. Uh, right up until his, his very last days. And um, we drive by one man walking, and he insisted on, um, you know, Dad said, let's give him a ride. But it, I thought it was pretty obvious this guy was out for a walk, not mm -hmm. that he needed a ride. And, and you know, and I said, gee whiz, Dad, let's just, let's just get to where we're going. So we turn and we go north on Albion, and all of a sudden there's this young woman with a suitcase standing, uh, you know, in front of Ward Park. And Dad, of course, says, let's let's give her a ride. <laughs> now, by this time, I was a little testy, okay? So what do I do? I slam on the brakes, okay? Slam, slam on the brakes, roll down the window, bark at the woman. You want a ride? If I was a woman, there's no way I would get in that car, you know? But she did. Mm -hmm. So she comes over. The back seat is filled with stuff. It's filled mm -hmm. with papers because when we went to lunch, the lunches were usually long, and there was a lot of reading material. So she had to, and I, I this was, this does not reflect well on me because I didn't help her in. And, uh, you know, she's kind of struggling with her suitcase and all this stuff in the back. But my dad immediately starts engaging her in conversation. Um, now, how she ended up in Ward Park <laughs> late morning yeah. with a suitcase, not knowing where her car was, um, you know, I, I kind of detected right away this could be a story that, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, my dad might not want to hear. But he he just, he engaged the woman so much by the time we dropped her off to where she thought she could begin her search for a car. Mind you, after he invited her to lunch with us. Um, <laughs> she was so taken with him, because I do remember this. She, she got out of the car, she walked all the way, she came back, and dad's window was open. And through the window, she gave him a hug. And um, so he not only connected with her, somebody he'd never seen before, sure. in strange kind of circumstances, the rest of us might say, you know what, let's just not yeah, talk about right. it. But it, it kind of also shows how much he, he, he kind of tolerated my own, um, in my own antagonism, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it didn't bother him. He, he, didn't, uh, he didn't let that at all sour or cloud his... He has relations sure. with this young woman. Sure. Well, he had that ability, that innate ability that not everybody has. You talk about lunch and the taco shop, and this is not a commercial now for uh, Taco John's, but I would go in there at noon and I'd see back in that back corner, Mike and you and maybe one of your brothers, and it looked like you were having uh, some sort of a meeting back there, and I was even even asked to join a few times, which I appreciated. Tell us about the taco shop. Yeah, well, we've never really happened a meeting. That was just the reading material I oh, talked okay. to you uh, about. So, you know, we, because um, we'd be there a while. My, my, my father had some operations late mm -hmm. in life, and they said, one, he needed to drink a lot more, and he needed to gain some weight, <clears throat> and uh, they usually preface that by saying with older people that can't be done but you know when you set you spend three hours in a place <laughs> with free refills it can't can be, be done, done. <laughs> so go. we were there and um uh you know uh, he liked the place and uh I, again the one thing i remember about that he connected with everybody who was there uh, uh <clears throat> there and they became very close to him mm -hmm. and they remembered him and, you know, when we would come in, as we were coming in, um, oftentimes they'd run to open the door for him. Mm -hmm. Now, me, I just wanted to keep going. 
Mm-hmm. Let's get through the door. Let's sit down. Um, but he stopped right there, <laughs> right in the middle. And he was going to talk to the person. He found sure. out where they're from, what they're doing, you know, all about their family. And um, I, I guess that's really why they, they came to have such an affection for him. And he had a time. manner of doing that where you wouldn't feel like he was intruding on their privacy. It never seemed to be the case. No. Yeah, not like, uh, yeah, not like, hey, I want to find out something right. from some kind of devious standpoint. It just seemed to flow. That, yeah, really did. Yeah. It really did. Well, I, I guess on a personal note, I, personal note, I really appreciated knowing Mike and Liz and your family. And Mike was a great uh, historian. And when he came down here, I learned a lot from him. I really enjoyed visiting with him. Anything else that you feel you want to add to our discussion? Well, we've talked a lot about my dad. Um, of course, he, he couldn't have done what he did without my mom, you know, because he was always getting involved in he was always getting involved in activities. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he, he did so many different things um, um, and got involved in things from his church, obviously, from the school, uh, the community, the Boy Scouts, uh, the Exchange Club, the Historical Society. And, you know, and my mom was always there. She never, um, she, she n- I never heard her complain. Uh, I think that's in growing up. You know, gee whiz, with eight kids sure. and growing up, and I go through in the book the split shift schedule we had after the high school burned down, the junior high school burned down, and the kind of demands that that must have put on, mm-hmm. you know, you really starting the day at six in the morning and ending it about nine o'clock at night. Um, but um, here's a story I think about my mom with respect to the patience she had. And they had they hosted an event at their house one time for uh, uh, widows of um, the Knights of Columbus. And this uh, older woman showed up early, mm-hmm. carrying a bag. And once my mom sat her down, so my mom was busy preparing, and so she brought her into the kitchen where she could kind of talk to her while she was working for the event and gave her a cup of coffee. And then this woman commences to you know, remove a chicken from the bag and began to pluck it. Um, it. It had just been killed, so it was fresh, the woman said, and this is what they could have for lunch. Well, you know, this was, my mom was, you know, I mean, she was hosting a social gathering at her house, and now chicken blood was dripping onto the kitchen floor. Feathers, little pin feathers were being scattered about, and if I were my mom, I would have said to my dad, never again, mm-hmm. not ever. But you know something, they went on to hold, I don't know, 13 or 14 more of those annual really? events, wow. you know. So, you know, they needed they needed both of each other. Sure, Yeah. sure. Well, thank you, Pat. Appreciate it. And uh, just a reminder, July 17th at the Pioneer Museum, Pat will have a book signing and a presentation on his book, The Power of Gratitude. It will be at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and 7 p.m. in the evening. So mark your calendar and be sure to join us. Wow, well, Lenny, that was a pretty incredible interview, I would say. It really was. Pat did a great job, and I think the thing that really uh, hit me was how, and I knew this from before as well, Mm -hmm. but how uh, Mike always had an interest in in people. He could talk to anybody and just be really positive about what they were doing, where they were at. It was always about them, never about him. It was all sure. about the other person. Yeah, that was a really interesting part of that Very interview. So. We want to thank everybody again for tuning in to our show, Out of the Past. Very happy to sponsor it. Uh, Pat's book, The Power of Gratitude, is available at the museum and the hub downtown. And Lenny, when is that book signing again? July 17th, 2 in the afternoon and 7 in the evening. Uh, book signing and a presentation by Pat Geary. Awesome. Everybody is invited. Please stop down uh, to check that out or, or any other day. We'd love to have you in. So once again, thank you from Lenny and I and hope to see you. There's a lot you can learn from Out of the Past. <laughs>